Well, hello, everybody. A very good morning to you. A very good morning. And I'm so, <laughs> my panelists are so excited they started already. So uh, that's great, great to, to see. Um, welcome to day two of the Filecoin Sanctuary. We can listen and enjoy to some fantastic content today and tomorrow with the CBC Catalyst in partnership, of course, with the Filecoin Foundation. The, the food, the drink is fantastic as well. The coffee is out of this world. So if anyone needs a caffeine, pick me up. Just go outside after this uh, session, of course. Now, we're going to start with our Filecoin friends and explore the, how the advances in modern technology can help verify ESG goals. Now, as you know, we have instant data available at the click of a computer mouse these days. But funnily enough, when it comes to verifying carbon data, there can be a lag of over a year in some cases. Now, this lack of speed and accuracy hinders companies trying to adhere to ESG targets, and it could also increase the risk of greenwashing. So we're going to spend the next 30 minutes discussing how open and transparent data can improve sustainability reporting and also, of course, and essentially public trust in sustainability goals. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome my wonderful guests and friends this morning, uh, starting with Alan Ransell, project lead at Filecoin Green. Alan, good to see you this morning. We're also joined by Suzanne De Bianca, Chief Impact Officer and EVP of Corporate Relations for Salesforce. Suzanne, welcome. We're joined as well by Dr. Andrew Steer, President and CEO of the Bezos Earth Fund. Andrew, welcome. And Alyssa Oberger, Chief Sustainability Officer of Baker and McKenzie, welcome. And a round of applause, please, for our panelists. If nothing else, for starting at uh, 10 o'clock and kicking off our, our day two of Davos. Um, let's start with the current situation. Alan, I'm going to come to you first, because as I said, we live in a world of real-time data, but when it comes to tracking ESG goals, like scope three emissions, it can be a year out of date, right. which is an extraordinary fact, really, isn't it? Well, how has this come about? Right, and so I think we have, we have great tools right now for working with private data, right? So tools like, like email, like documents, um, but, um, sustainability, right, is, is this, this global set of challenges where we need to convene stakeholders that um, are making decisions, not just based on private data from one company um, or one organization, but they really need to be able to share data and make that data open and verifiable across the entire economy, right? And we, we just fundamentally need better tools to do that, that work with many of the tools that we have for private data. But typically, sustainability reporting is done once a year. And if you imagine a long supply chain, the out, if, if you change, um, if someone at the, the beginning of a supply chain changes something, right, that changes the carbon intensity of their products and they report after a year, then it can take, um, it can take a long time for their customers to know what that change, um, to, 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 um, to assess the, the effect of that change on, their, on the carbon intensities of their products, right? Then their customer reports after a year and so on down the supply chain, right? And so I think a lot of the challenge is how can we use public data and publicly verifiable data in order to fill these gaps and allow people to verify the, the information that they're submitting. Um, and we, at the Filecoin Foundation, we focus a lot on building tools to allow people to make that data open and publicly verifiable um, and, and uh, work on this balance between um, uh, privacy and data privacy um, and, and openness that allows you to address that public trust deficit in a lot of the sustainability. And issues. speed as well, of course. Um, yep. Suzanne, let's bring you in here, here now. I know that you said, or certainly your organization at Salesforce <laughs> say, you can't track what you can't see. And I know as the world's largest CRM platform, when you speak to your, pl or your customers, what are they telling you about these issues? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me um, here today with these esteemed colleagues of mine. Uh, you know, we think a lot about carbon relationship management and, you know, we're a software company. So we think the best thing that we can do for climate is to bring our software and our tools to bear. Um, our goal is to get all of our customers to net zero. Um, many companies have set aggressive targets, but you're right. You can't manage what you can't measure. So we've built an incredible tool called Net Zero Cloud. Uh, that we're very excited about as it relates to uh, auditable data, which I think is really important. We're seeing regulation that's beginning to hit here in Europe. Uh, also, what I hope anyway to see it soon in the United States. And so uh, it's very important. BCG did a report that said about 85% of enterprises are using spreadsheets to manage their carbon data. And there's just natural human error um, as it sort of relates to that as a, as a tool for managing carbon data. So are they guessing? 
I mean, initially inputting. Well, yeah, well, you're inputting, but you have just a higher probability for error. Yeah. Um, and we believe in real-time data is really powerful and have invested in a great company, for example, called Measurable, that's doing real-time energy data management. And we are able to sort of suck that right into your system so you can see as you go throughout the year, not at the end of the year, how you're doing, yeah. for example, on your emissions reductions targets. It, it makes sense. Um, Andrew, I mean, you've had a, a stellar career, to say the least, uh, working in this in this sector. Of course, now you, you run the Buzzers Earth Fund, but before that, you were at the World Resources Institute, and you actually were in charge of the organization that built the Greenhouse Gas Protocol way back when. So how do you think we should handle the, the, um, the lags in reporting do you, as we've seen the problem so far? What's your solution? Well, we're still climbing the learning curve. I mean, 20 years ago, it was uh, the Wild West, yeah. you know, companies wanted to, um, uh, you know, count their greenhouse gases, but actually there were no clarity in terms of how you do it. Um, and we've come a long way. You mentioned scope three. I mean, just so people know there's scope one, that's the emissions you yes. come from your own factories. Scope two is where you get your energy from. Scope three is the difficult one. It's your entire supply chain and at both up and downstream. And some companies have thousands of suppliers and thousands of those that they hand their goods off to. Measuring all of that is very complicated. Um, and then you're supposed to report it to uh, one of the reporting agencies like CDP or whatever. Those are not as transparent as they should be. Um, so I think the way we should look at it is we're, we're sort of 15 years in now. And um, 10 years from now, we need to be much, much better, much more transparent. And that's what this discussion is, is really all about. A consumer or an investor um, or a staff member of a company needs to know what are they really like? How well are they actually mm -hmm. doing? And they need to get annual data. Um, uh, we don't necessarily need it to be published more often than, than a year uh, annually, but you certainly need to know the journey that the company is on. And of course, with technology, we're now able to do things that we couldn't do. So for example, the Basos Earth Fund is, um, is financing something called Land and Carbon Lab, where for the first time ever, we'll be able to see not only trees that fall down to 10 meters by 10 meters, but trees that grow, crops that change, and we'll be able to estimate the carbon embedded in that, the so-called carbon flux, everywhere on the Earth's surface every single week. Why is that relevant to this? Well, if you're a food company and you're buying oil palm, you need to know where does it come from? Is it honorably um, harvested and grown? So that's one example. Another thing we finance is, uh, is uh, uh, satellites for uh, methane measurement. So you'll be able to measure methane everywhere on the Earth's surface and you'll be able to then measure your greenhouse gases much better. But of course, there are many, many other sources of greenhouse gases, and we're still, <clears throat> it's still work in progress. Yeah, <clears throat> sounds, sounds like it. Please, Alan, can, can I, I jump off of that? Very yeah, quickly, and I think, then we'll go to Alyssa. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of these, these sorts of advances really are where, when you're able to build systems that take data from many different sources, you can, you can really improve this sort of reporting. And yeah. an example of this that we're very involved in in Web3 is measure to earn programs. So people who are on the ground on the front lines of the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis, they need some way to make money and put food on the table that doesn't rely on degrading the, the natural systems that they're the stewards of. Mm -hmm. And so many projects um, like GainForest, like the Open Forest Protocol, like the Regen Network, um, allow these people to take measurements of the natural systems that are, are just part of their life and submit those into um, into web3-based systems that then allow you to, to get that sort of transparency that you're talking about and see, yeah. I have this carbon offset, what does that carbon offset actually mean for facts on the ground, Especially. right? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the tree that was planted or set of trees? What is using inexpensive drones? How can we take that carbon offset and relate it to measurements of the local environment and actually bring um, stakeholders who are, are stewards of that land into the entire mm -hmm. system and include them in a, a substantive way? Yeah. yeah. Some great, great ideas there. Alyssa, let's bring you in now. Um, I, I read with interest that uh, Baker McKenzie sees it's the world's first climate change law firm. I think you were kind of it, it back in the game many, many years ago. Um, what's your view on, on out-of-date data impacting ESG initiatives and, and the, the kind of raising the sceptre of greenwashing and general lack of trust? What issues do you see? So I don't know that I worry so much about the out-of-date data. I think what I worry about is the unreliable data, the non-verified data, the fact that we 
need to have confidence in the data that we're pulling. So if we're looking at scope one and two, that's one thing. If we're looking at scope three, where we need to look upstream and downstream, we absolutely need to get every single link in that chain. And what we tend to see is that in many instances, companies, the supply chain opacity, if you will, they just don't know. They haven't really mapped out. So to me, starting with your good baseline data, auditing your supply chain, knowing every single link of it is step one, but then you really need to get to a place where you can be confident that what you're pulling from your suppliers is actually valid and accurate. So there, you know, there's, if you've got a big supplier, they might be able to do it more effectively. They can probably you know, even engage in external insur assurance, whereas if you're dealing with a small supplier, you've got all kinds of issues around you want to be able to work with diverse, small, minority, women-owned businesses, but yet do they have the tools to do it? So I think the more we can democratize data and the more we can make it easily accessible, we will get to that place where we'll be able to have a good view of scope three that we can feel confident in. And once we feel confident, we can publish our results with more confidence, and that builds trust. And I think a lot of the, the greenwashing, to your question about greenwashing, mm -hmm comes from the fact that a lot of people have made a lot of very aspirational statements without any idea of how to get there, right? So they've, they've said great things, and then they don't really have a plan. And so they've either gone out to the market too ambitious, and then they fall down, and they've got an issue. They've got an activist, they've got an NGO, they've got employees, they've got customers mm -hmm. that aren't happy. Or on the flip side, because they're a little nervous about that legal risk or about that reputational risk, which is sometimes more important, they don't want to go out to the market and they get called out for not doing enough. Yeah. So it's kind of a lose-lose or win-win, depending upon. Yeah, how you Suzanne, at. let's bring you in. I know that Salesforce talk of the net zero cloud, which is your kind of initiative to deal with this issue as a single source of truth. I mean. Can it work across the industry? Do you, I mean, because there needs to be alignment, doesn't it, across yeah, the Yeah, and I would say, I mean, it's very different in some cases, a manufacturer uh, versus a retailer versus a, a software company, for example. But you're, however, 80% of the data is often the same. And so we're really trying to listen um, to what our customers are looking for and build it into this solution. So scope three is, uh, to Alicia's point, has been um, a challenge for many, many companies. We've just put a scope three module out. Uh, a what if scenario what, is something. What, sorry, to yeah, yeah. why is it such a challenge? Can you give us an, an example? Well, because it's A, with not within your control. Mm -hmm. uh, trusted, I think there's a crisis of trust. And so making sure that you're getting trusted data uh, is very important. Uh, we were speaking yesterday and for our suppliers, uh, we've put now, a supplier exhibit in place where we're uh, asking all of our suppliers to make science-based targets. It's one lever that I think we can use together to help us go faster. Uh, so scope three is, it's also uh, within the regulation still unclear uh, and within the standards a little still unclear. So this is something that we're just thinking a lot about in terms of getting all the data in one place so that you can verify it, you can audit it, and you can really trust it. Yeah. Um, so, Alan, when it comes to open data, particularly decentralized data, which we're all kind of understanding what that means now, I mean, are there other applications for this technology? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, tell us about them. Well, I think that a lot of what, what Web3 is contributing in this area um, really um, complements, you know, this, this verifiability, right, that, that we've all been talking about, right? And really, it doesn't... I think there are a lot of ways in which Web3 is offering new tools and new solutions that very much can work with cloud-based systems like the Net Zero Cloud in order to just allow people um, a greater degree of visibility into um, the, the data underlying all of these statements, right? And so, you know, one example, right, is this measure to earn programs. Um, or another example is um, just allowing people to have the supply chain traceability um, uh, in order to assess both scope three emissions and um, in order to solve things like the biodiversity crisis, in order to allow people to um, get a green premium from producing products in a way that are more sustainable. So an example of this is we're working with a, a group in Suriname that's harvesting Brazil nuts. Um, native people are harvesting these, these Brazil nuts and we're working to allow them to trace along the supply chain um, every step of the way from harvesting them in order to, um, you know, until they're, they're sold at the end. Um, and allowing you to see not just that um, someone has attested that, um, that these Brazil nuts are from this particular forest or area, 
but actually allowed the people who are performing these operations to own their own credentials mm -hmm. and log in and allow you to publicly verify that they did what they said they did, right? And so it's it's not it's it's not that we are you know completely replacing a cloud-based system. It's mm -hmm. that we're we're allowing people to um, get this degree of, of cryptographic confidence yeah. that this data is actually accurate and comes from where where people say it does. Andrew, let, let's bring you in now. So we're on the, we're on the cusp of of maybe solving this issue in terms of open, transparent, and immediate data. What are your hopes of how it could improve the, the carbon offset market, which you know, in some respects, as you said, is doing great things, but it's still coming under various degrees of kind of negativity when you, with, the, with the issue of companies particularly can't really tell if what they're buying or investing in is actually doing any good. Yes. Well, it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, there's a parallel between what we're now trying to do, which is measure carbon and, and greenhouse gas emissions, um, which requires a lot of accounting and auditing, with, say, financial accounts. Now, in the case of financial accounts, I mean, we took 200 years to develop, you know, standards, generally accepted accounting standards, and to create an entire industry of accounting and auditing and thousands of people around the world and billions of dollars every year are spent on that kind of thing. The, the, the problem is we don't have the 200 years to do it now. We've got to do this in a decade at, at, at most. Yes. And so we're sort of on this incredibly sort of uh, fast track. And as you say, uh, companies made uh, well-meaning promises yeah. before they really knew mm -hmm. how they could do that. Um, it's not really fair to trash them now and say, oh, it's a sham and yeah. so on, um, because actually we like the fact that President Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon before the end of the decade, and he didn't know how they were going to do it. We admire that, and we should admire companies that are doing it. The point is they have to have a journey where literally month by month they approve, improve their capacity. You ask the question about um, carbon markets. Uh, carbon markets have been plagued by um, leakage, by the failure to measure, and now we're making a lot of progress. I mean, we now have standard-setting bodies, both on what we call the supply side and the demand side. So the way a carbon market works, if I'm Salesforce, um, uh, I want to uh, purchase an offset. I need the supply that I can really trust. That's a project. And what we know is you can't simply say, I'm going to protect this bit of the forest if they then go next door and cut the next bit back. So you've got to have what we call a jurisdictional approach. And there are some very tough standards now uh, that, that now companies, which you do, I know, can adhere to. Um, and there are ways of actually measuring it, both through remote sensing, but also on the ground, through drones and all kinds of things. So we are making progress on that. We still have a lot of cowboys that are, that are doing projects that are not very good. And we need to call them out, because we now know how to do a good one. There's also what we call the demand side, which is if, oh, by the way, Salesforce is a great performer, so I'm using you as a good example. <laughs> but let's imagine another company says, actually, decarbonizing my own scope one, th two, and three is just too difficult for me. So instead of doing that, I'm going to buy some cheap offsets. I'll pay $10 a ton. And then I'll be able to say, I actually, I'm moving towards net zero. In fact, I am net zero. Well, no. Before you get any credit at all, you have to be on a path on your own scope one, two, and three. And that's where the science-based targets initiative come in. You need to sign up to that. And everyone needs to be transparent. Now, that is, again, it's a journey. We're nowhere near where we need to be. Yeah. So you've got organizations, one's called VCMI, that looks at the, the demand side. And then there's one called the ICVCM. <laughs> the whole thing is alphabet soup, by the way, um, that, that is looking on the supply side. <clears throat> so progress has been made, but it sounds complicated, especially for me as a layperson. You know, and if I want to invest, I mean, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. And so listen, let, let me bring you in now, because the, uh, the age-old question is, what, what does good look like? Because you, you're all doing great things, but it's hard for someone, maybe who's not in the industry, to, to kind of work out what is and what isn't really working, what helping. So in order to get a harmonized like, framework, regulations, really what I'm asking, what, what do you think needs to happen and what is happening, kind of, I what's coming what down the track? Yeah, what we're seeing, and I think it's a good, I'm a proponent of, of regulation, I think it's a good thing because I think everyone needs to measure, and if you don't measure, yeah. you're, we're never gonna make progress. So it's great to talk, but we need the measurement. What's 
good is that in the US, we've got the SEC, which is making, it's going in the right direction. In the EU, we take a slight, slightly different approach because we've got the double materiality, which is a difference from the SEC, which is very interesting, which I think also because we are encouraging not only disclosure with the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, but we're also proposing due diligence with the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. So we're really looking at not just measuring, but also going in and auditing supply chains and understanding what's going into things. The main complaint that we hear and what we what we've came out, we did a survey earlier this year with sustainability professionals and general counsels, and one of the issues that came out as a barrier was the fact that there's no harmonization. So then we've got things like the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, coming under the IFRS Foundation, which is trying to propose harmonized standards, one set of standards, but what we all need to remember is those will not be the regulation themselves. The ISSB is not a regulatory body, right. but we can hope that that direction of travel will be that people will start, start adopting those uniform standards and we will get that harmonization. Because what's really challenging for organizations is, okay, I'm an American listed company, mm. I'm listed <laughs> in the US, I know I need to comply with the SEC, yeah. but I've got a bunch of subsidiaries with yeah. significant turnover in the EU, in the EU how do I balance those two? So you know, do you make concessions and find a common denominator? And I think what everyone's asking for, and I think it just came out in the UNGC Accenture study, begging for globalized regulation so that we're all playing on the same field, the level playing field, really essential. I mean, you're all nodding, so I'm gonna to come to yeah. all of you. But um, uh, Suzanne, I want to come to you first, because I know that Salesforce signed a letter to the SEC back in 2021 um, saying that you're an advocate for mandatory climate disclosure. And I know that you're a very powerful voice in the industry. So how are you getting any traction? How, how is that kind of movement going? Yeah, thank you. And we've been disclosing our carbon data since uh, for almost a decade. Uh, on our proxy statement uh, in our 10K, uh, in addition to our uh, annual report that we've been doing. So uh, I think we all, what's been very interesting to me is who has been moving this conversation forward fastest is the investment community. Right. And so in the absence yes. of government regulation, I've been very grateful um, for the investment community who is really pushing it uh, far fast. and. You know, as it relates to quality in the, in the carbon markets, I just want to build off something that Andrew said. You know, I, it's critical to have an emissions reduction target. Salesforce has a 50% emissions reduction target, uh, absolute emissions by 2030. And then uh, you must do what you can. It's a yes and conversation in my view to offset what you're currently uh, expending in carbon in the carbon markets. and. There is more transparency. Uh, we don't want perfect to be the enemy of the good. Uh, we have an incredibly rigorous process and where you had asked about, you know, what does quality mean? For us, it is biodiversity. It is the inclusion of indigenous people. Uh, there are so many important things about investing in biodiversity that have secondary benefits uh, in addition to the emissions target. So I think You'll see, you can see we've published some policy principles in blue carbon and green carbon, and really looking at how do you have a holistic approach to when you think about the carbon markets than just thinking about it as a, only as a carbon sequestration mechanism. Okay, Alan, do you wanna come in? Yeah, of course. Um, I think one thing I'd, I'd like to sort of bring into this is, is interoperability, right? In that there are, are many different standards mm. um, and it's, it's difficult to, make sense of all of them in a way where you're able to actually um, take different data sets, relate them to each other, and take your, your final set of sustainability statements and really show how that's related to all this data that you're pulling in from all these places. And, yeah. and like you said, Suzanne, uh, you know, this is largely based on Excel spreadsheets yeah. right now, which is not, not sort of where we want to be, right? And so one of the things that we think about a lot is content addressing. Um, the, the typical web um, is based on location addressing, which is where you, uh, uh, you access information based on where it is on a server. And in Web3, what we really focus on is accessing information based on the content of that information itself. So what content addressing is able to give you is this universal coordinate system for data. And where we're really pushing this, um, that's especially relevant to um, interoperating between all of these different standards in this field is pushing that to um, 
being a universal coordinate system for the format of data, not just the underlying data itself. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to let you do is define these different transformations between standards, yeah. um, say in, in carbon offsets is a yeah. great example of this, and really in, in, a, in a, a more open source way allow you to allow anyone in the world to write programs that, you know, little snippets of code, right, that just transform from one standard to another and then allow you to, to automatically build these transformation pipelines that mm -hmm. then let you take data from many different sources and show what that, what that sort of ladders up to in the standard that you're interested in reporting to. Yeah. Um, so for example, CDP. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, I want to bring you in now. Is it really interesting what Suzanne, you said about the investment community kind of coming into the fray now and that kind of being the real advocates to, to move towards more regulation. Of course, you know, $10 billion fund, uh, the Bezos Earth Fund, so you've, you've got uh, the, the power of the money behind you. Do you agree with that? And would you like to see more kind of uniformed regulation to make it easier to be accountable? Yes, look, we, we Suzanne's absolutely right. You know, we originally thought that the demand for better standards would come from consumers. Yeah. And it, it does to some extent, but actually we didn't understand that it would be the financial yeah. sector that why, would come in in a big way. Why is that, do you think? Well, it's, 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 um, uh, it's partly because I think pension funds in particular, um, uh, but now actually funds from all sources of savings, are saying, actually, if I, I, I want my pension to earn money for me, but actually, I also want to do the right thing. And starting in, well, Europe, but also places like California, the California Teachers fund, <laughs> Pension yeah. Fund, you know, they said, actually, we're teaching climate change to our kids. We want, I want my pension to be honorably invested in a way that we never would have imagined. I mean, if it, I, a long time ago, I did a PhD in finance. And if somebody had said, by the way, the job of the financial industry is to solve the problem of climate change, I would have said, you must be... What are you smoking? It's not the job of finance at all. The job of finance is to make money and assess risks and so on. And now, amazingly, the financial sector is saying, if you want me to invest in your company, mm -hmm. if you want me to buy your bonds, then you are going to not only have to give me good financial accounts that are audited, you're going to have to give me good greenhouse gas uh, uh, accounts as well. And it's a wonderful blessing. And you know, we were all surprised when in the Glasgow COP, um, you know, $130 trillion of financial assets under management committed to becoming net zero. Now, that sounds like a small thing, but if you think about what it means, by the middle of this century, um, that every bank, every financial institution would have to know that all of the tens of thousands of loans and investments they've made, that those companies, adding them all together, are going to be net zero. It's sort of like mind-boggling, yeah. and that requires then them to work through the entire supply chain. So I, I was uh, chairing the uh, climate change advisory group for a major uh, international bank, and they said, look, you know, I mean, we've got 10,000 corporate clients in Asia. Mm -hmm. 9,000 of those today don't even measure their greenhouse gases. How can I possibly move towards net zero? So what they're now doing, which is amazing, which is what you're doing with your suppliers too, they're actually having seminars for their, uh, for their, their clients to say, we want to lend you money, we want to be your banker, and by the way, the way the wind is blowing, you had better get real on the issue of climate change. So it's, it's an incredible dynamic, and it's so easy to sort of say, oh, it, you know, these guys are sham. Well, it's difficult. And we have to keep our eyes on them to make sure it keeps improving year by year. Okay. So as we come towards the end of our time together, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd really love just to get a kind of closing comment uh, from each of you. Alyssa, if we, if we can start with you, if you don't mind. Um, I mean, your thoughts on kind of what you want to see from Davos this year and also where you want to go in this particular area when it comes to new technology helping to kind of get more verifiable and transparent ESG reporting. So what I am thrilled to be getting out of Davos thus far is meeting great people like those yeah. on this panel. And also, the, I find a really good focus on sustainability and, and much more of a deeper dive than what I've seen in the past. So I, that's been really encouraging to me and what I'm looking forward to continuing to do this week. Uh, in terms of what I would want to get out of the sustainability, out of the technology, is I think everything we've been talking about, really the ability to 
have confidence in what we're pulling, have confidence in what we're reporting, and have confidence to work both upstream and downstream to make sure that we really know what our emissions are, that we're not talking about the hypothetical, but that we're really yeah. able to make measurable progress. I think the time is over for feeling good and saying we need to do this. It's the time to do it. And so that's what I'm excited about the technology mm -hmm. for, how that facilitates that. Dr. Andrew Steer, what would you say? I absolutely agree with that. Uh, you know, we've gone from five years ago, I don't know whether I really can get into this, it's too complicated, two years ago, this is fantastic, I'm declaring net zero, and um, uh, it's win, win, win out there, um, and well done, everybody. And now it's Monday morning. <laughs> Actually, it's, it is coffee. tough. And what we're seeing is, <laughs> which is great, is it's a, it's a much edgier, more raw, but much more genuine discussion where we actually need each other and we've got to be disciplined and we've got to turn from this well done kind of to, okay, let's get on with it. Well put. Suzanne? I think I would say we have to accelerate action uh, is the most important thing. And I, you know, here at Dolphins, there's so many conversations about macroeconomic headwinds and et cetera. You know, two things about that. Climate change does not care um, on how the global economy is doing. And we have to continue to go incredibly fast. We have seven years to hit the Paris goals. And what I'd say um, to many of the corporates here is done well, you can actually have a win-win. You reduce your emissions, you reduce your cost at the mm -hmm. same time. You invest in renewable. Right now you can make you know, good money off renewable given the energy prices. So it's not an either or conversation. We have to go fast uh, and we have to work closely together to do it. Okay, thank you. Alan. 100%. Um, I wanted to key off of something that, that Andrew said, um, which is that really this, the, the notion of value is changing, right? It didn't used to be the, the goal of the financial sector to, to align with, with climate goals or biodiversity goals, um, but now it is. And I, I think we are able to do so much more technologically in terms of tracking that value and how it, how it passes through the economy than we were. And I really want to underscore how quickly um, these tools are evolving and allowing us to do even more. Um, so I'd say our level of ambition as to um, how we report should be very high. And if people want to plug into how these tools in Web3 especially are evolving, um, the Sustainable Blockchain Summit, which is going to be immediately after the MIT Energy Conference, is a, is a forum to do that, to discuss how sustainability and Web3 intersect with each other. Mm. Thank you. That's very well put. Thank you so much. Alan Ransill, Susanna DeBianca, Dr. Andrew Steer, and Alyssa Aberger. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. You did really well. Okay. So you can, um, you can jump off the stage now, and uh, unless you want to stay for a bit longer, you're more than welcome to.